Chapter Two of *The Turn of the Screw* by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This came home to me when two days later I drove over with Flora to meet, as Mrs. Groves said, the little gentleman, and all the more for an incident that, presenting itself the second evening, had deeply disconcerted me. The first day had been, on the whole, as I have expressed reassuring. But I was to see it wind up in keen apprehension. The post-bag that evening—it came late—contained a letter for me, which, however, in the hand of my employer, I found to be composed but of a few words, enclosing another, addressed to himself, with a seal still unbroken. This, I recognise, is from the headmaster, and the headmaster's an awful bore. Read him, please, deal with him, but mind you don't report. Not a word. I'm off." I broke the seal with a great effort, so great a one that I was a long time coming to it, took the unopened missive at last up to my room, and only attacked it just before going to bed. I had better have let it wait until morning, for it gave me a second sleepless night. With no counsel to take, the next day I was full of distress and it finally got so the better of me that I determined to open myself at least to Mrs. Groves. "'What does it mean? The child's dismissed his school.' She gave me a look that I remarked at the moment, then visibly, with a quick blankness, seemed to try to take it back. "'But aren't they all?' "'Sent home, yes, but only for the holidays. Miles may never go back at all.' Consciously, under my attention, she reddened. "'They won't take him?' "'They absolutely decline.' At this she raised her eyes, which she had turned from me. I saw them fill with good tears. "'What has he done?' I hesitated. Then I judged best simply to hand her my letter, which, however, had the effect of making her, without taking it, simply put her hands behind her. She shook her head sadly. "'Such things are not for me, miss.' My counsellor couldn't read. I winced at my mistake, which I attenuated as I could, and opened my letter again to repeat it to her. Then, faltering in the act and folding it up once more, I put it back in my pocket. "'Is he really bad?' The tears were still in her eyes. "'Do the gentlemen say so?' They go into no particulars. They simply express their regret that it should be impossible to keep him. That can have only one meaning." Mrs. Groves listened with dumb emotion. She forbore to ask me what this meaning might be, so that presently, to put the thing with some coherence and with the mere aid of her presence to my own mind, I went on. "'That he's an injury to the others.' At this, with one of the quick turns of simple folk, she suddenly flamed up. Master Miles, him an injury!" There was such a flood of good faith in it, that though I had not yet seen the child, my very fears made me jump to the absurdity of the idea. I found myself, to meet my friend the better, offering it on the spot sarcastically. To his poor little innocent mates! "'It's too dreadful!' cried Mrs. Groves. "'To say such cruel things! Why, he's scarce ten years old!" Yes, yes, it would be incredible. She was evidently grateful for such a profession. See him, miss, first, then believe it. I felt forthwith a new impatience to see him. It was the beginning of a curiosity that, for all the next hours, was to deepen almost to pain. Mrs. Groves was aware I could judge of what she had produced in me, and she followed it up with assurance. You might as well believe it of the little lady. Bless her!" she added the next moment. Look at her! I turned and saw that Flora, whom ten minutes before I had established in the schoolroom with a sheet of white paper, a pencil, and a copy of nice round O's, now presented herself to view at the open door. She expressed in her little way an extraordinary detachment from disagreeable duties. 
looking to me, however, with a great childish light that seemed to offer it as a mere result of the affection she had conceived for my person, which had rendered necessary that she should follow me. I needed nothing more than this to feel the full force of Mrs. Grose's comparison, and catching my pupil in my arms, covered her with kisses in which there was a sob of atonement. None the less, the rest of the day, I watched for further occasion to approach my colleague, especially as, toward evening, I began to fancy she rather sought to avoid me. I overtook her, I remember, on the staircase. We went down together, and at the bottom I detained her, holding her there with a hand on her arm. "'I take what you said to me at noon, as a declaration that you have never known him to be bad.' She threw back her head. She had clearly by this time, and very honestly, adopted an attitude. "'Oh, never known him! I don't pretend that!' I was upset again. "'Then you have known him?' "'Yes, indeed, miss, thank God!' On reflection I accepted this. "'You mean that a boy who never is—' "'Is no boy for me!' I held her tighter. "'You like them with the spirit to be naughty?' Then, keeping pace with her answer, "'So do I.' I eagerly brought out, "'But not to the degree to contaminate—' "'To contaminate?' My big word left her at a loss. I explained it. "'To corrupt.' She stared, taking my meaning in, but it produced in her an odd laugh. "'Are you afraid he'll corrupt you?' She put the question with such a fine, bold humour, that with a laugh, a little silly, doubtless, to match her own, I gave way for the time to the apprehension of ridicule. But the next day, as the hour for my drive approached, I cropped up in another place. What was the lady who was here before? The last governess. She was also young and pretty, almost as young and almost as pretty, miss, even as you. Ah, then, I hope her youth and her beauty helped her, I recollect throwing off. He seems to like us young and pretty. Oh, he did, Mrs. Grose assented. It was the way he liked every one. She had no sooner spoken, indeed, than she caught herself up. I mean, that's his way, the master's. I was struck. But of whom did you speak first? She looked blank, but she coloured. Why, of him? Of the master. Of who else? There was so obviously no one else that the next moment I had lost my impression of her having accidentally said more than she meant, and I merely asked what I wanted to know. Did she see anything in the boy? That was it right? She never told me. I had a scruple, but I overcame it. Was she careful, particular? Mrs. Grose appeared to try to be conscientious. About some things, yes. But not about all. Again she considered. Well, miss, she's gone. I won't tell tales. I quite understand your feeling, I hastened to reply, but I thought it, after an instant, not opposed to this concession to pursue. Did she die here? No, she went off. I don't know what there was in this brevity of Mrs. Grose's that struck me as ambiguous. Went off to die? Mrs. Grose looked straight out of the window, but I felt that, hypothetically, I had a right to know what young persons engaged for Bly were expected to do. She was taken ill, you mean, and went home. She was not taken ill, so far as appeared in this house. She left it at the end of the year to go home, as she said, for a short holiday, to which the time she had put in had certainly given her a right. We had then a young woman, a nursemaid who had stayed on, and who was a good girl and clever, and she took the children altogether for the interval. But our young lady never came back and at the very moment I was expecting her I heard from the master that she was dead. I turned this over. But of what? He never told me. But please, miss, said Mrs. Grose, I must get to my work. End of chapter 2